All right. Uh, my name is David Golden. I'm an employee at Heroku. I'm going to be talking to you today about the Celery Canvas module. Um, Celery ships with a lot of tools to compose tasks together into workflows, uh, but as I've talked to people about their use of Celery, a lot of people are either unfamiliar with these tools or they're afraid of them because they're not quite sure how they work uh, or they don't really trust them. Um, so my goal today is to kind of pull back the curtain, show you what's going on with these uh, workflow tools and show you how you can even extend and create your own. But before we get to that, I want to talk about some design principles of Celery tasks in general, um, apart from the, the Canvas workflows. Uh, in my opinion, a good Celery task is atomic. Uh, in a concurrent system, you don't want to be leaking intermediate state uh, out to other parts of the system. So you should have uh, clear success-fail scenarios where uh, any state that changes, changes as immediately as possible uh, and only when the task succeeds. Um, that you know, keeps your tasks from interfering with other tasks or other parts of your system. I think tasks should also be item potent. Uh, tasks will fail in creative ways, um, whether you, know, you lose a process or um, an API goes out or something like that. You want to be able to pick up where you left off and be able to execute your task over again uh, so that you don't have to have manual intervention when a task fails. If your tasks are item potent, you get this for free. And for the purpose of our uh, workflows, tasks should be composable. Um, this is you know, the same as it is in func functional programming, that you should think of your tasks like a function that have one concern, uh, take arguments for all of the state they need or ways to access that state, uh, and return something that's useful for other functions to consume. So uh, a lot of people focus on their choice for the uh, Celery broker, but they overlook the result backend as an uh, architectural choice. Uh, the result backend is really important for these workflows, so it's worth taking some time to talk about uh, what it does and which one you should choose. First of all, uh, the result backend is in charge of of tracking task state. So uh, when a task is sent to a broker, uh, Celery marks a task as pending. Uh, when it, you know, it's then started by a worker and marks started, uh, success or fail, um, you need a result backend in order to know what state a task is in. And of course, uh, to know uh, what it returned, um, what you know, value or object the function returned that the, the task was running. So which backend should you choose? Uh, I implore you, if you take away nothing else from this talk, um, please uh, do not use RabbitMQ as your result store. Uh, what's actually going on here is that Celery will use a message queue in Rabbit because that's Rabbit's only tool, so everything looks like a queue to Rabbit, um, F -F as the result or state. And when a client asks for that result or state, Rabbit will actually dequeue the message from the queue. Uh, the, the person who's asked, or the task who's asking will consume that, and the next one who asks will get nothing. There's nothing to get. So the next time you ask for the task state, it says, uh, I don't know, it's pending. You can also use a database for your result store by um, using Django Celery, uh, and the, the Django ORM models are provided for results. But um, pulling in a database can be kind of expensive, and it doesn't support all the operations that make our workflows work well, as we'll see later. Also, if you happen to be unfortunate enough to be using MySQL, uh, you could have problems from your transaction isolation level, where you know, one process sees one, one answer, and another sees another for like what state am I in. Memcache is a pretty good choice for result backends, um, but it's not persistent. So if you care about your results sticking around you know, when the process uh, restarts, then Memcache is probably not your best choice for result backend. Uh, it does, however, have atomic counters, uh, which are nice. It supports expiry for keys, because uh, you don't want your results to be hanging around indefinitely, forever. Um, yeah, but that persistence problem causes me to want to choose Redis normally for my result backend. Uh, it has you know, all the same properties as Memcache, with the exception of sharding. Um, but you, know, you can usually keep it pretty persistent. You could lose a little bit of data, but generally not much. All right, so now let's get to the actual building blocks uh, for Canvas itself. The most fundamental building block of the uh, Celery Canvas tools is the signature. 
Uh, it's important to remember as we go forward that everything uh, in the uh, Celery Canvas module is based off of signature. So what is a signature? A signature is simply a serializable representation of a task. Uh, it is a subclass of a dictionary, uh, and so it contains the um, import path uh, for the task itself. Uh, any arguments and keyword arguments uh, that are needed to be passed to that task uh, and uh, other options. So you see we can uh, JSON dumps a uh, signature, and then signature also takes, and it's in a dictionary, so we could, we could uh, dump it, uh, load it back in, pass it to the signature to rehydrate a signature. Uh, and you can see how this would be useful when passing you know, across a message bus, consuming the other side. Um, this is basically how task serialization works in general. Um, so when you send a task over the wire, um, it's always creating a signature, always passing that signature through the message broker and back to the worker to be consumed. I'm sorry? So, oh, um, subtask type we'll get to a bit later, uh, but for, for normal tasks, it's none or null. Uh, for the uh, workflow types, which aren't actually a task, but they're a serialized representation of a workflow or a group of tasks, uh, the subtask type is a key that tells Celery um, which type of registered signature to use in order to reconstruct this signature object. So there's a mapping in, in Celery of the subtask type to the uh, signature class. And if it's null, it just creates a normal signature class. But if there's something like chain or group in there, then uh, signature knows about those registered types and uses that subtask type to key off of which signature subclass to rehydrate. Uh, there are convenience methods provided on signatures in order to treat them much like you would tasks. Um, those pass through normally to the task if it's just a, a single task signature. Uh, so you can, you can run delay, you can run apply async. There are also convenience methods off of tasks themselves, which you can use to get a signature. Um, I think in Celery 3.1 it's still .subtask, but in 3.2 it's .signature, or .s for short works in both 3.1 and 3.2. You can uh, pass those uh, methods, arguments, and keyword arguments that are then stored into the signature and serialized. Um, you can even kind of build up arguments and, and continue to add arguments, keyword arguments, uh, with the exception of uh, immutable signatures. So signatures can be marked as immutable, and then their arguments are frozen. Um, this is useful in situations where something else is adding, trying to add task arguments for you, as we'll see later. And if you want to prevent that from happening, just make your signature immutable. So now that we are able to serialize tasks, we can begin to compose them um, by constructing tasks that, um, that interact with other tasks. Uh, the most simple unit of composition is a callback, which is a task that is launched based on another task finishing. Um, the result of the parent task uh, is passed to the child um, as that task's first argument. So you can see here we have a couple of signatures for a task that just adds numbers together. Uh, but the second one only has a single argument. Uh, when we call this dot link method uh, on the signature, uh, you can see then when we um, convert it to a dictionary, the uh, link option is set to the list of tasks that are linked to it. And so um, Celery, when it finishes the first task, will say, okay, are there any linked tasks for me to run? And if so, I'm going to run them uh, and pass my result as an argument into that next task. So here, the uh, result of the child task is six, um, one plus two being three, then added to three being six. But the result, uh, async result object we get back from actually applying async on the original signature is the parent task's result. So result.get will be uh, three, and then we have to navigate down to the children property to see all of the dependents or child tasks uh, and navigate to its result to see the result of the callback task. Um, we get one step farther down with chains. So chains are multiple tasks run in series, uh, and they are actually um, chained together via this callback mechanism. So think of a callback being, you know, one task launches another. A chain is one task launches another, launches another uh, for as many tasks as you specify. So 
when we construct a chain, we can give it any number of, of task signatures. Uh, you can see that so when we cast it to a dictionary, those then get uh, put into a tasks um, keyword argument. Uh, the result from the chain is actually the async result of the last task in the chain. Um, that's an important distinction because then the way you treat that result is different than you would for a normal callback. Uh, it makes sense for a chain because um, when you chain things together, you're saying basically this is a set of dependencies on the last task. And so you really want to know what is my end result. And so Celery passes back to you the async result of the last task in the chain. And if you were to inspect its state, you would see pending, pending, pending while the other tasks in the chain were executing. Uh, but it would have populated the parent property so you could navigate using dot parent, dot parent, dot parent kind of back in the chain up to the very first task and kind of inspect the state of the chain as it's being executed if you wanted to. So what's going on under the hood here, um, these are not complete code slices, just as much as I can fit on a slide, uh, is that when you run the chain, um, it's actually going through a process to prepare all the steps uh, by navigating through each of the tasks uh, and uh, assigning the task to the link uh, of the previous task. So it's taking the task before it and it's saying, uh, I want to link it to the current task. And that creates this chain of callbacks um, remember, dot link is the way that we assign one task to be a callback of another. Uh, and so then that uh, prepare steps um, returns all the tasks and their async result instances, and the run method just takes the first one and uh, calls apply async on it. It's kind of like lining up all the dominoes and then just tipping the first one over, and all the other dominoes, you know, continue to fall in series. So, uh, next after chain, we have group. Group is uh, entirely different. It's not built on callback or chain, uh, and it's intended for a group of tasks that are meant to be run in parallel as opposed to in series. Uh, now, one important distinction and difference uh, between group and chain is with chain, uh, you care about the last result in the series because you want the end result. In group, all of the tasks are treated as equals because they're all run in parallel. So uh, what Celery decided to do was to create a new async result subclass called group result, um, whose dot results or, or dot children, that's the, they're both the same in group result, um, represent the async result instances for each child task. Um, the group result, you notice, has its own UUID that is distinct from any of the UUIDs in the child tasks. Um, that is important uh, because uh, normally when uh, you ask Celery for the result or state uh, of, a, of a job, it uses the task ID, the task UUID, and it will um, track that in the result store. Uh, but there is no state for a group result because uh, this UUID doesn't actually map to a task that's being executed. It's an abstract concept for a group of tasks that will be executed. Uh, so you can see here the serialized version looks very similar to a chain. The only real distinct difference is this subtask type group. So, you know, the uh, signature is registered as type group. Um, Celery sees that group and rehydrates it as a, uh, as a group instance. Um, yeah, so if we iterate through the child results, we get, you know, the results of each task. Uh, there is a bit of coordination uh, with Celery here because of this distinction between an async result and a group result. Um, so Celery has a lot of branching around, if this is a group, do this thing. If it's just a regular async result, do this other thing. Um, but you can see that apply async actually constructs a group result from the list of applied uh, subtasks. Um, this apply tasks generator, it just goes through and, and applies async on the individual task signatures and then you know, yields each one's uh, async result. So what you get, it's a group ID, which is the UUID of the group result that I mentioned, and then um, all of the async result instances from the subtasks. So uh, now we've covered chains and groups. What happens when you want to combine them? The cord is the most complex uh, type uh, of all of the uh, Celery Canvas workflows. And basically what it is, is it's a group uh, chained to uh, a callback. Um, so you have a group of tasks that are executing in parallel. 
And when all of the tasks are done, really when, when all of them have succeeded, then it launches this uh, callback task. The group it calls the header, and the callback task it calls the body. So you can see the body and the header in the, uh, the uh, dictionary version of the signature. Um, so the uh, body task actually gets a list of all of the results from each of the header tasks. Uh, and so this tasks.tsum here uh, would get um, a, a list as its argument passed to it um, you know, by celery. And then in this case, it would just sum all the numbers together. Um, the result, uh, the async result uh, returned from executing the cord is similar to the chain. It's the uh, result for the body task. Uh, so then, you know, when you call dot result on it or um, dot state or whatever, you'll see the state or result from uh, the body task. And if you navigate back to its parent, it's, uh, it's linked to the group result um, corresponding to the group of header tasks. And so you have this kind of like asymmetric relationship here where the async result's parent is the group, but the group's children are all the, the group's subtasks. You can't actually get from the group, the header group, back to the, uh, the body result. So it's kind of an odd family tree. But you can see that you can still inspect each task and uh, results from the group, get the individual results, and then they're summed together in this uh, callback task. Um, so this requires a fair bit of coordination from the result backends in order to work. Uh, the cord knows how many tasks are in its uh, header group, and so it stores that as its cord size. Um, the, uh, the task tracer, then any time a member of a group, which is part of a cord, uh, completes successfully, will react in some way uh, based on the back end of the result store uh, that will determine whether or not the cord's callback should be executed at any given point in time. Um, so, as I said, different backends work different ways, and this is where the atomic counter comes in handy. Because with memcache and Redis, uh, once the header group has been executed, then any time a member of that group succeeds, it increments a counter uh, based on that group UUID. Uh, remember that, that group ID is distinct. Uh, and then once that counter reaches the size of the cord, then it knows that it's okay to run the callback task. It can gather all the results from all the header tasks in the cord or in the group and pass those to the body uh, callback. For all the other uh, backends, Celery actually launches a separate task whose only job is to pull the group uh, for the results of its children. And if all the children are in a success state, then it knows it can call the callback task. If they are not, then it launches a retry. Uh, and it will retry with a certain countdown. I can't remember how long it is, but um, it'll, it'll wait and continue to pull and pull and pull until the uh, group is finished. Uh, so you can see how it would be advantageous if you want that callback to run quickly uh, to use a result store that supports atomic counters. So these are all of the primitives that Celery provides um, by themselves uh, for composing workflows. But if you wanted to, you could have built something like Chain, for instance, yourself, without any support from Celery. It's just a subclass of signature. Um, Celery's support of the link uh, function for linking callbacks gives you everything that you need to chain them all together. Uh, so I have uh, created something that I call a weave that is just an example of how you could extend the already existing primitives to create your uh, own uh, distributed workflows. So a weave is just a, a custom signature subclass that takes a task and uh, takes a numeric length of a list. Uh, it accepts a large list as its argument, as its first argument, and it splits it into smaller lists according to the list size that you specify. It passes each of those smaller lists into the task that you gave it, uh, and it takes the results of that task calls a join task to join the subsequent smaller lists all together back into a single big list and returns that back to you. So in this case, range does exactly what you expect, gives you uh, a list of numbers, and multiply takes each uh, member of the list and multiplies it by two and returns uh, a list with each member multiplied by two. 
And so you can see the kind of trace of the path of what the weave does in order to uh, retrieve a list at the end that is the same as the original list with each member multiplied by two. Uh, there's a little more code than I could easily fit on the slide here, but you can see uh, I um, call this class decorator uh, register type on the signature subclass, and I provide a subta subtask type of weave, and uh, that tells Celery to register this, uh, this signature as a type weave, so anytime it sees subtask type weave, it's going to construct a weave uh, instance. Um, I, I put weave as a second arg of the uh, init here. Um, to uh, the, That arg represents the task that is associated with it, but since there is no real task associated with all these signatures, I could have put none there just as easily because Celery is never going to try to launch an actual task for a signature subclass uh, that doesn't represent have a one-to-one -one representation of an actual task. So in my apply async, um, basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm uh, taking an iterable from the args that I assume will be applied uh, to the signature at some point later than its init, because I only take the task and the list size in the init. Uh, I create a chord out of this join task that I use as the body, and a group of header tasks that are cloned from my original task that I passed in, um, you see down here at the, the end, tasks.clone, and I provide it an arg that's a subset of the original list as I chunk the list uh, or the iterable into the iteration size that I want. Uh, and so I end up with a group of uh, tasks that are all the same task with different sublists passed to them, uh, and a uh, join task that joins all the lists together, and I create a chord out of it, and I return that chord, and this is my custom, custom signature subclass. So uh, why would I do this? Well, let me give you a practical example um, with a Twitter API integration. The Twitter API allows you to ask for friends or follower IDs in groups of up to 5,000 IDs per API call. And because we want to consume the API as efficiently as possible, if we're trying to get all of your friends or followers, of course, we would ask for the maximum number of IDs we can get. But if we want any other information on those users than their ID, we have to request the full user object and Twitter limits those calls to 100 IDs per call. So in order to get a full list of 5,000 5, usernames, we would have to make a single API call for all the IDs and then 50 API calls of uh, 100 apiece in order to get the usernames out of the user objects. Uh, you can see how this would be a natural fit for the weave concept that I've created. So um, without any special coordination, with just this weave signature subclass and those basic tasks, I can now construct a workflow uh, which results in a single list of all of my Twitter friends' usernames um, based on using uh, chaining this friend ID call to a weave containing username uh, task with size 100. So I'm making calls of 100 IDs at a time to the uh, user's endpoint and getting the user objects, extracting the usernames, and the join tasks joins them all back together into a single list. So this is just an example of the kinds of things that you can do with a Celery Canvas workflows um, by creating your own signature subclasses. So it's important to note what happens when one or more tasks fail in these workflows because, um, well, uh, it, it may be kind of unintuitive uh, and it may be catastrophic depending on how you architect your tasks. So, you need to know um, what happens. Uh, when you run tasks in parallel, it's pretty benign. Um, you can get the uh, state, success or fail, for each of the tasks individually. You can inspect the results. Remember, in a group, all tasks are created equal, so nothing is going to prevent anything else from running. Um, you, know, you just see that some tasks failed and some succeeded. If you're running tasks in series, then it's kind of like you know, flicking one domino out of the series of dominoes, right? Like it takes one to fall over to hit the next one. And if you've got a gap or one missing, you know, that's an analogy to a task failure, it's not going to knock over that next domino. And all of the subsequent tasks are going to fail uh, to, to run. Um, this makes logical sense because um, things in the series are, are uh, they create a dependency chain, right? And so if you have um, a, a prerequisite that it's not fulfilled, you can't run run the thing that, uh, that, it, that depends on it. Um, but it's just something to be aware of. Uh, 
you should be uh, very defensive in your coding about trying to retry tasks that have transient failures um, until they succeed and understand that any chaining or callbacks uh, won't run uh, if the parent task fails. So I've put together a few rules of thumb that aren't directly related to workflows but are kind of some best practices throughout my years using Celery. Um, the first one I feel like is pretty obvious. Never block on a task from a task or from any process, really. Um, you're, the whole idea of Celery is that it's meant to be concurrent. And if you have one process waiting on another process to finish and doing nothing, then you are wasting your concurrency. Um, so uh, always find ways to compose tasks together rather than blocking on one task and getting the result in a synchronous manner uh, before moving on with, uh, with you know, your other task or the other process. Um, that should be fairly obvious. Uh, you want to try to design your tasks to do the smallest useful amount of work. The reason I put useful in there is because um, there is a fair bit of overhead involved in serializing your task, sending it over the network to your message broker, um, sending it back over the network as a worker consumes it from the broker, deserializing before you even begin to run your function. Uh, if you do something like, I heard one company once um, say that they were putting all of their database rights into Celery tasks, um, like one database write per task, and they were seeing terrible performance, of course, because the overhead of just doing the database right in the process is less than actually doing all that work to make it a task. But if you're doing like an API integration or something like the Twitter example I showed, it's a really good rule of thumb to have, say, you know, like one API call per task or something like that. The smallest useful unit of work that you can create will give you the best uh, return for your concurrency buck. Um, a lot of people don't know about the soft and hard time limits in Celery, but they can be super useful uh, in uh, kind of having some guarantee about how your worker pool uh, resources will be used. Uh, if you have uh, tasks that um, you know, can in some circumstances take a really long time, maybe because you know, Facebook is slow right now or some, some other resource is, is constrained, uh, then it can be really useful to interrupt those tasks and if you make them item potent, then there's no downside of running them over again. Uh, and uh, if you've already uh, made them small amounts of work, then you haven't lost a whole lot. Uh, and see, all these design principles begin to work together to create a system where you are using your concurrency well, where you can fail without worrying about it. Uh, and then the time limits will give you um, good guidelines for uh, good guarantees for how long your tasks uh, will take at most before they just get axed, get killed. It's important to set both soft and hard because um, as I've shown here, uh, some tasks don't respond to the uh, exception that gets raised for the soft timeout and they have to actually be killed um, like when a thread is waiting to join. So axelate is another uh, underused feature in Celery. Um, what happens when a worker consumes a task from a broker is commonly that broker will set a reservation uh, for um, how long it will hold uh, the task uh, before reissuing it into the queue and to another worker. Um, and the way that a worker says to the broker, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's all right for you to remove the task to, from the queue is by acknowledging or acting uh, that it's received that task. Um, celery workers by default will act when they start working a task. Uh, but you can conceive of workers dying mid-process without being able to communicate back to the broker. Um, Celery will try to revoke the task and try to send it back to the queue, but that's not always possible. Like if there's a network outage and or power outage, all kinds of things can happen uh, and things will just die. So when you're acting early, uh, you can lose tasks from workers that have partially worked the task and then gone away, weren't able to revoke it, so it never went back to the queue, and now your task just drops on the floor. If you ax late, the worker will not ax the task until it reaches a terminal state, either a success or failure. Uh, and um, in that case, you're guaranteed that the task will be re-executed if something happens to the worker. The risk is that um, if that reservation time on the broker expires before the worker can act it, then it will go back into the queue and be worked over again by another worker. So you see how this could work in tandem uh, with your soft and hard timeouts so that you can guarantee your uh, execution window for a task uh, and 
uh, if you are making tasks idempotent um, and, and quick and all that good stuff, then Axlate will give you much better safeties against tasks being lost midstream. Uh, yeah, that little note from the Celery doc explains it pretty well. Uh, there's another one that I didn't make a slide for, but I want to cover. Um, in Celery 3.1, at least, the default serialization uh, method used is pickle. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys saw Alex Scanner's talk at um, PyCon uh, this past year, but uh, pickle can do very bad things to software. Um, and it's not only a security concern, um, but you know, say, for instance, that you want to um, send a Django model instance as a Celery task, which is already a bad idea to begin with. Uh, if you're using Pickle and you, know, you, you uh, send your task to the broker, it serializes everything as well as it can. Uh, and let's say it's in flight and you do a database migration or a deploy or something that changes the model somehow, right? Um, the model instance will get um, un unpickled or, or reloaded uh, with its old class definition, and you now have Celery tasks that are running against some class definition that doesn't match it, and bad things will happen. This is the problem with Pickle in general. So um, the and a really easy solution to this is to just use the JSON serializers. Um, not only will that avoid all of the security concerns with arbitrary code execution that Pickle uh, potentially has, um, but uh, it will force you to use uh, task arguments that are JSON serializable. And I, I feel like that's just good for everybody. In fact, so did Ask because he made it um, the default in Celery 3.2 and actually warns you, gives you a big nasty warning if you use Pickle in 3.2 or later. Um, yeah, so I think that's about all I had. So now I'll take any questions you guys have. Or I can keep talking about Celery stuff that's not on the slides. Yeah. Um, the, the return value signature, uh, what is that? It didn't pull up. So I mean, is it a string or is it? What, what do you mean by return? Signature is a class. So what do you mean by the return value of a signature? Uh, so when you call this, like, okay, so you're building. I'm just curious if that is, is a, like, an item or a, a, a deterministic thing. Or if I, if I call the same signature with the same arguments. Mm -hmm. Um, the uh, under uh, the question was um, like how do you I assume how do you determine signature equality is that kind of what you're saying okay the under under EQ um, it doesn't like traverse the args and quarks to determine if the signature is effectively the same like if it's pointing at the same task so if you do you know signature like uh, tasks dot add dot s one two equal equal tasks dot add dot s one two then it'll give you false because it's looking at the Python object IDs. Um, so unfortunately, that's not implemented, though it could be pretty easily, I feel like. Um, but uh, one thing that you can do uh, is uh, if you are passing a signature around and you are afraid of um, two different processes trying to uh, uh, run that, that same signature, um, what you can do is uh, freeze the signature. Uh, and the dot freeze method will go ahead and assign a UUID for the task ID for that specific uh, signature, and it will give you back an async result instance. And so then any time you get an async result back from that signature in the future, it'll use the frozen async result. Uh, and so that can be useful uh, to uh, prevent, um, you know, the, the uh, or at least so that you can tell that the same task was run twice because it'll run with the same task ID. Things will get really screwy, but at least you can tell. Yeah. Yes. So tasks, uh, the question was, um, can you uh, reduce um, multiple tasks to be worked in the same process, right? Yeah. Um, 
tasks are, are meant to be independent units of work, like not really related to other tasks unless you're actually uh, explicitly relating them together. Um, but what you can do is uh, you can determine either in, in uh, real time as you're launching the task or ahead of time in the task definition um, what queue that task is intended to go to. And then you can have different worker pools working different queues. You can have a worker, a single worker pool working as many or as few queues as you want. So if you want to make sure that the same Celery process, the same Celery worker is going to run all of these tasks, you can create a queue specific to that worker and send those tasks through that specific queue. Now it won't like squash all of them down to, to run only one function. It'll run still task after task, but at least you'll be in the same process space. Does, does that help at all? Um, not really. But okay. I Uh, but no, I'm. Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, it was, it was. It's a good thought that'll help me keep thinking about my problem. Um, so, I mean, you could you could have, um, I don't know, uh, some sort of, um, you know, uh, counter or some external state that is a flag for you know how many of these are, are in flight right now. Or, or some sort of uh, distributed lock, you know, like the, there are different mechanisms you can use on top of Celery, outside of Celery to help control the flow. I don't know your specific scenario, so. Right, something I'm gonna have to keep looking into. Yeah. Yes. Is anyone um, generating callbacks into a graphical console to like observe the progress of what I think was presented as a weave? Um, so in, uh, the, in a graphical way, um, the only thing that you have uh, at your disposal is you, Celery does provide um, methods that will create a graph viz visualization out of uh, a um, async results dependency tree. So you know you have dot children and dot parent, and that creates an inherent graph, right? And you can create a graph viz visualization. Um, it's kind of expensive to do, so I don't think anybody's doing it in real time. Uh, Celery does have a monitor tool, monitoring tool called Flower, um, in which you can. Uh, it's a web interface to be able to track what tasks are in flight. You know, there's a, a URL endpoint for each task UUID, so you can see um, how that task kind of progressed when it started and when it ended. And uh, I think you can link to parent and child tasks from within that. So you can kind of, you can use that web uh, monitoring tool to kind of stitch together your own, you know, internal visualization of what's going on. Um, but the graph viz output is the closest thing that Celery has to support of a graphical view of that. Thank you. Any more questions? I mean, I, I can keep talking about stuff if, yeah. if you want me to. You're very welcome. I, have, I yeah. go on all day. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, obviously, when you're working in a, a distributed system, um, uh, log collation uh, becomes really important because you want a single place to look for uh, where did this thing get run. So um, just a, a, a quick shout out for Heroku. Our log collation is awesome. So um, you can you know see all of your uh, dinos, uh, your worker dinos, um, collating into a single log point and then drain that to wherever you want to. Uh, and um, so then if you're using a tool like Flower and you want to know what happened to this task, um, I want to see the log output, uh, then just take the UUID and you know, using Logly or Splunk or whatever, you can actually search for that UUID in your collated logs. And that's really the only sane way to debug Celery stuff because you, know, you never know where something's going to run. Um, uh, you often can't reproduce issues locally that you had in production. Um, and so I really recommend uh, log collation, being able to search your logs, uh, and um, keeping track of your task UUIDs somewhere. And the answer to almost all bugs in, in distributed systems is, is more logging. <laughs> uh, it, it, things can always, almost always be solved with, with the right logging and more logging. Um, 
So uh, I really highly recommend that. Um, Additionally, uh, there, there are debugging tools that work better, work best locally. Um, there's this PDB variant in Celery called RDB um, that will uh, allow you to set a breakpoint inside a task and will actually open um, a telnet uh, on, on a port, uh, a unique port per uh, task. So you could have, you know, um, 10 tasks running in parallel in a group, set a breakpoint, an RDB breakpoint of those tasks, and it'll launch you know, 10 telnets on different ports. And you can actually telnet into your Celery process uh, and then poke around just like you would with PDB. And that can be really useful for uh, debugging. Um, yeah, what else? Yes? About Heroku? Brokers. Brokers. Oh, I'm just hearing what I want to hear. Um, yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you want to know where we were? Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, I said I didn't talk much about brokers. So um, the only thing I have to say about brokers is that uh, if you're using anything but RabbitMQ or Redis, you're asking for trouble. Um, because even though there is support for things like, you know, SQS and IronMQ and CouchDB and, God, Mongo, um, you, they're, they're not fully supported. Like, there are features that are going to be missing. There are things you can't do, like this, this flower monitoring tool only works with RabbitMQ and Redis um, brokers. Um, I, I prefer RabbitMQ because I feel like it's a tool made for the job, but it's also more configuration to set up, and some people don't like the configuration hassle. Um, uh, if you don't have, like, uh, your file descriptors bumped up, in your file system, then you can crash Redis or RabbitMQ. Sorry, uh, if you have a ton of tasks or a high queue depth, um, there are different things that can go wrong. It's operationally more intensive to run RabbitMQ, but I feel like it's the best tool for the job. Redis is good enough to the point where you know, like, I don't know, it's not a huge deal if you want to run Redis as your broker. But I wouldn't run any of the other ones. Thanks. Hmm? Well, if you guys have any more questions, I'll be here in Ohio for another couple of hours at least before heading to the airport. So just uh, track me down. And you know, if you're looking for a job, as we all are, I'm sure you know, we're hiring. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for the great presentation. Thanks.